progress report. You will find that you made a good and wise choice coming to this session this afternoon. This should prove to be one of the more interesting sessions of the entire conference, not being a little bit prejudiced, but I am. I think that what we're going to find today is some very interesting information relative to how we're progressing on SLS and Orion, as well as I think, Kathy, this is the premier event of you coming out of the closet talking about the Global Exploration <laughs> Roadmap for the first time okay, since it was officially released. So that should be an exciting discussion. And then ISS is always doing interesting things, and I think Sam will give us a better idea of some of the clever things that are going on there, and hopefully we can take good notes to start sharing that with some of our colleagues and neighbors and friends, uh, maybe do a little better job of advocating advertising and advocating all of the cool things that we do as an industry. Just for your information, this is being recorded and will be put on the AIAA website later, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll start out with uh, Mark Geyer talking about how we're progressing on the Orion. Mark is the program manager on the MPCV Orion and he's been the program manager since 2007. Prior to that, he was the deputy constellation program manager from 2005 to 2007. And then before that worked on IS, uh, well, let's see, prior to that, he was manager of systems integration at NASA headquarters, so he had to put in his time in the, the beltway in the logic free zone. And then also worked on ISS prior to that. Mark has a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering from Purdue and a MS in Aerospace Engineering from Purdue. Mark? Thank you, Don. Oh, and by the way, what we'll do is we'll go through all presentations and then we'll have questions at the end. So I, do I just hit the ad enter advance or what would I do? Ah, okay, cool. Great, down air, thank you. Uh, I thought I'd stand up, just I feel a little more comfortable standing up talking about this. So we're going to, I'm going to start by, uh, we'll go over Orion, what Orion uh, is doing, um, what the future looks like for Orion, and talk a little bit about where Orion's headed. Of course, uh, I really like, this is a great panel um, for a couple of reasons. One is Orion doesn't go anywhere without SLS, so Todd is a key part uh, of this exploration future, so we're working together uh, in great detail as we go forward, and also there's actually a little piece of Orion that's related to ISS now that the, spa now the service module is actually being provided by ESA. So there's a really big link here between these uh, different topics today. So let's see. So uh, this, you know, Todd will talk more about destinations. This is really kind of the, an Orion view about the destinations. I show uh, Space Station as a reference. Space Station, of course, is uh, 220 miles, which is quite a ways up. When you think about the moon, it's a thousand times that distance. And then, of course, asteroids are obviously further in Mars, even further than that. Uh, Orion fits the architectures that go to these uh, cislunar space regions, including Lagrange points and including the region that this uh, asteroid retrieval mission would be a part of. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, it'll be interesting to, to uh, listen to that panel that's going to be tomorrow to talk about that in detail. Uh, Orion can go uh, actually out to the uh, actually go to the asteroids with, in conjunction with the HAB module and can go to Mars with the HAB module and other propulsion elements, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I think the, the, the key here is, and we talk a lot about affordability and a lot about how, how to keep on a path, and one of the things I think that really matters about that is that we take the systems we have and we're evolving them to these different destinations, and we'll talk about how Orion has done that and can do that, and that's really a key part, I think, of being able to do these missions in the future. Uh, so this is what Orion is. Um, you see us in the context of uh, the SLS is below us. The upper stage, the ICPS is actually part of, uh, of SLS and Todd will talk about those. And just above the upper stage is the service module. Service module has a lot of the supplies. Uh, it's got the big propulsive element that gets us to uh, in the deep space areas that we're going to be, but also has life, um, air, water and those kind of supplies. It, pr it generates the power. You see the solar rays there. Um, and uh, it basically helps us get to where we're going and give us the power to do that. Above that is the crew module. The crew module is where the crew obviously resides. That's what we call it that. It's how the crew interacts with the spacecraft. It's where their suits are, where their food is, uh, and where all the displays and controls are for the crew. Uh, and then all the systems it takes to return them safely to Earth. 
and you'll see a lot of that in the rest of the pitch. Uh, on the top is the launch abort system. Um, one of the benefits, uh, key parts about Orion and SLS is we can get the crew off in any phase of flight, regardless of what the failure is, we can get the crew back. Um, the, S the launch abort system is a very energetic system because in the worst case, when we're pretty much close to the transonic region, you need a lot of thrust to get the vehicle off, you need to be able to control the launch abort system. So that's a 500,000 pound solid rocket motor that it takes to get the crew off. It'll accelerate the crew at about 12 Gs. Uh, so it'll be a rough day, but the crew will be alive. And it's a key part of protecting the crew all the way through uh, all phases of flight. So the launch abort system is a key part of the Orion SLS system. Um, this uh, shows a little bit about the, uh, the ESA participation. You know, we talk about, we think about when you go to Mars, you're obviously going to be going with partners. Uh, we certainly did that in Space Station. We showed that the United States can lead. Uh, even though, uh, and have other partners as a part of that. Of course, Sam will talk about more more about that. So we don't just talk about an exploration, we're actually doing it here. So a big part of Orion here is the service module that will be provided by the uh, European Space Agency. So what I've highlighted in white is the part that will be provided by ESA. And what, what that is is the region that's the solar rays. So if you look at the solar rays, they look a lot like an ATV. That's why uh, a lot of synergy with their heritage hardware. They'll do the propulsion tank system, the RCS thrusters, uh, the radiators, uh, the primary structure for that area, and so forth. Uh, we'll give them the main engine. Those are Ohm's engines from the shuttle, so we're actually going to provide those. We're providing the AUX thrusters from Aerojet and other pieces, but fundamentally that white area there will be provided by ESA. The, the black area, the darker, are still NASA Orion, um, a Lockheed provided, so a lot of the stuff that we're flying on EFT-1 uh, we will use, we will keep those designs and fly them on EM-1. So now ESA is a part of the program. Um, our PDR is now in November, so a lot of good work there already and moving forward with ESA. Um, we've been, you know, I call this kind of the Orion Magical Mystery Tour. There's been a lot going on uh, since we were started, <laughs> a lot of changes, uh, but a lot of testing too. You think about um, all the things we did to look at landing, whether we're going to land on land or water. Uh, the avionics architecture, uh, we did our pad abort one where we actually fired that 500,000 pound solid rocket motor out at White Sands and, and everything worked great. Uh, a lot of tests like environments, like acoustics, we did a lot of uh, acoustic tests, a lot of parachute drops. In other words, to refine the design so when we went into production, we had a lot more confidence. And EFT-1, which is the flight you'll see there in FY14, which is basically 12 months uh, from now, uh, will fly in September of 2014. Uh, is the next phase of that. We'll actually, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Basically, we're going to take an Orion and send it into 3,000 miles into space and test the uh, entry systems. Uh, then next will be, uh, in conjunction with uh, SLS uh, in 2017, uh, we launch an unmanned uh, full-up Orion system with a service module. Then we do an ascent abort test, which I'll talk about briefly, and then we fly people on, on EM-2. Uh, so this is EFT-1. EFT-1 is a chance for us to uh, really push on some of the higher risk items of Orion. So you think about when you fly into space, there's a lot of things that drive risk. A lot of these are separation events, like getting the launch abort system off, like dropping fairings, like separating the crew module and the service module. All these operations have to um, happen successfully to have a good flight and to protect the crew. Also, entry navigation and guidance is compl complex. Uh, the, testing the heat shield is important since it's very hard to test that on the ground. Uh, and then all the parachute deployments. So we'll push this Orion system about 3,000 miles into space. We'll use the Delta IV to do that uh, and then enter. So when, you, when you're about 3,000 miles of altitude and you enter, you get to about 84% of the velocities we'll see coming in from the moon. So it's a very good test to test the heat shield system. Uh, so again, we're going to do that in, uh, in 12 months. And we will recover the Orion system off the coast of uh, right here off the coast of California, and we'll use a uh, well deck ship, the USS San Diego, strangely enough, which is, we're going to go visit the crew uh, on Thursday. And so we're using one Navy ship to help us do this job, and I'll talk a little bit about why we did that. But that we're including not just the flight test, but also test of operations, recovery operations, a mission ops in Houston will also participate in this test, looking at data. We can send some command to the spacecraft as needed. So it's a way for us to exercise not just the hardware, but also operations. Uh, EM-1 uh, will be uh, the first launch on SLS uh, with Orion. It'll be uncrewed, right, as we test those systems out. 
There's a lot of potential orbits we could do, one of which we're studying with uh, Mr. Dumbacher and ESD is what we call a distant retrograde orbit. It's, a, it's an orbit that gets you close, similar to what you might do on this asteroid retrieval mission. Uh, we do things like using the moon for gravity assist, acceleration, a lot of things like that. So we're fleshing out the details. Um, clearly SLS gives us the delta V and Orion in the service module can do this mission, so we're fleshing out the details of how we'll fly that. So another uh, interesting mission to kind of make sure we're ready to put crew on this system. Um, between uh, EM-1, which is unmanned, and EM-2, which is manned, one of, one of the last things we need to do to qualify the abort system is we need to do another uh, abort test this time rather than doing it from a standing start, which is what we did on pad abort one. We'll actually put the launch abort system close to uh, um, max, max dynamic pressure and close to transonic speeds. And the reason we do that is that is the next most complicated part of an abort flight. And the hard part of that is can you control the launch abort system so it doesn't tumble. Uh, if it tumbles, it'll break apart and you, you obviously don't succeed in saving the crew. So it's a very complex test. Uh, we're going to, uh, to save money, uh, we're actually going to use a peacekeeper first stage to, do, to go do this test. It's something that the DOD is basically surplused. Uh, we buy them from them and Orville does the integration. We fire that stage and it puts us in exactly the right conditions we want. Then we fire the launch abort system in and we'll test that. We're also going to fly this out of Florida, so we'll, we'll be able to test recovery and everything else on the, on the East Coast for an abort. So that's a big test for us, again, after EM-1. Uh, EM-2, again, we're still working with uh, Dan uh, Dumbacher and ESD on exactly what we would do on this flight. Basically, this is the first man flight. So we're clearly going to be checking out the life support systems, things you, that are hard to do when there's nobody on board. Displays and controls, the other things that you do, uh, the, the final things you need to add before you put crew on board. So we'll talk about how long we're in low Earth orbit to test those systems out and how far we want to go while we test these, uh, the details. But there's a lot of options here for the first manned flight. Um, asteroid retrieval mission, you probably heard a lot about this. Again, there'll be, a, I guess, a lunchtime session tomorrow where they'll talk in, in greater detail. Uh, I look at this as, uh, and, I, and I appreciate the, will, the way Bill describes it, I think it's an opportunity to take things that we're already doing, some things that we're already doing, expanding on those and putting them together into a mission. For when I think about Orion and SLS, uh, it's a way to demonstrate our capabilities in, these, in this deep space application, and it uses functions and capabilities that we already have. So clearly SLS can get us to this location. Um, the service module in Orion can do the operations in this region. We would use the crew module kind of as an airlock. We depress it, have the crew go outside in a simplified EVA suits, uh, and then repress the CM and then come home after we've uh, rendezvoused and done the experiments with the, uh, with the asteroid that will have been brought to a high lunar orbit with an unmanned spacecraft. So there's a lot of pieces to this about how to get the asteroid to high lunar orbit and what that unmanned spacecraft looks like. And I know, uh, I guess Brian Muirhead is on the agenda for tomorrow, so you hear a lot more about that from him. Uh, but for our systems, fundamentally, uh, it's, it's a very small putt to make our systems do this mission and fit what needs to be done. So, you know, I'm kind of excited that we have something in the near term to work toward. Um, Extensibility. So that asteroid mission to me is just another example. That's probably the third or fourth mission that Orion has been asked to assess since we started. Um, and we've been able to do all those missions. Uh, when I think about, so again, saving money in the future, you want a system that can adapt to the changing political environment and changing mission uh, goals. And Orion has shown it can do this. This design has shown that it can do this. Um, I'll, as, Part of its ideas of going to Mars, there are probably as many ideas of how to get to Mars as there are people in this room. A lot of good ideas, a lot of things to think about. The last uh, major study that NASA did looked at crew size. What would the crew size, the optimum crew size be uh, on the surface of Mars? And you think about things like uh, system knowledge, medical knowledge, uh, international partners, and, and, so, and science and those kind of things. And they found that the optimal crew size was about four to six people. Um, leaning more towards six. So Orion can accommodate six people. It's base diameter. We actually did a design in the early phase that can do that. So if you're thinking about a capsule system to get people to and from Mars and, and have them enter, you want a system that you don't have to redo to add a Mars mission. And Orion, we can do that. And we've shown that with the ball. This shows the different sizes. I know it kind of looks funny. This is the 95% uh, male and the, you know, 
5% female, and that's the kind of stuff you have to do when you size the seats and so forth. You kind of have to lay it out to make sure you can handle all those variabilities in crew size. So it's not a family with three kids and the, <laughs> and the dogs in the trunk, you know, so it kind of looks funny. That's how it might look. I'll speed through some of these because I'm probably... Uh, we did a big test, you know, this solid rocket motor, when it fires the, the, at the rim, it's about 180 decibels, so it's loud. And so it drives a lot of acoustic energy into the structure, which is important for us to understand when we're designing the, the components. So we did a big acoustic test out at Lockheed. Uh, we did a lot of parachute drops. Parachute system is very hard to model. Um, a lot of interactions, so we do a lot of failure testing. We fail shoots, we fail drogues, just to make sure we understand how the system will operate. Uh, we did drop tests in the water because water interacting with the structure is, again, hard to model. It drives mass in the system if you have a lot of uncertainty, so these tests have helped us really refine the structural thickness, for example. This is a picture of, of how we're going to do this, well de this recovery with the Navy. They're going to use what they call a well deck ship. Um, these ships exist. Obviously, they use them for amphibious operations. They have them on the East Coast, West Coast. Um, what we'll do is, is recover the Orion and, and bring it into this flooded well deck, and then they'll drain it, and the Orion will be sitting on this uh, structure that's kind of in the middle there. So our concept today is that's actually how we would recover the crew. So the crew never has to get out of the capsule while they're in the water. Uh, it's a very safe operation. So this was a test we did in Virginia with the same kind of ship, but we'll be using the USS San Diego uh, a year from now to recover it. And uh, so we'll talk to the crew on Thursday. Uh, so, you know, why is, a, why is a crew module so hard to build? You know, why is it difficult? Well, this gives you a sense for the complexity of the systems. This is the exterior of the crew module itself, and you see the thrusters. It's a little hard to see, probably from the back there. But there's 300 tube welds. If you look at it, is it right here? Okay, thank you, Tom. Right there. Yeah. So there's 300 tube welds. Let's see, anyway, a lot of welds. Uh, 250 harnesses. Uh, you see the thrusters. Here's the hydrazine tanks. Here's a helium tank. Uh, a lot of valving. Um, incredible amount of work that goes into the, a system like that to make it fly. Uh, this is looking from the top. And so this is where the, the parachutes go in these locations. They've been delivered to the Cape. These are pitch down uh, thrusters, so a lot of work going on there. Uh, this, this is a back shell template. This, I've, I liken this to building a house, and when you put the drywall on, you go, oh, that's how it's going to look. So kind of same kind of thing. These are templates for the back shells, which are made of composites, where we put shuttle-like tiles on them, because on the back shells, it doesn't get as hot as the bottom. So we can have lighter tiles. They're actually better for MMOD as well. So this gives you a sense of what it's going to look like when those come together. Another RCS pod. Uh, the heat shield. So the heat shield not only has to account for 5,000 degrees when you're coming in, but it also has to handle the impact, the, the structural impact landing loads when you hit the water. And we have to accommodate different wave heights, and we have to be able to land also if we fail a chute. So there's a lot of different load uh, cases that we have to do. So this structure of the heat shield, primary structure, is a big piece of, uh, of the of how we protect the crew. And so this gives you, this is a titanium stringer system, and you can see how it's biased toward, this is the direction in which we're gonna land. So it's much, a lot more stringers here than here. So that shows you how we've already optimized for the direction of landing to minimize mass and still protect the crew. Uh, this is actually the ablator part, which is mounted to the composite uh, below it. So this is an Avcoat um, ablator that's installed in uh, Boston. So we finished that entire system it's being cured and now we're machining it down to the abs the, the uh, fine uh, the absolute depth that we need that we've modeled for the flight so that heat that uh, heat shield should be shipped to the Cape in about 50, um, 45 days so another big piece this is something avionics guys love to see the rest of us go what is that thing um, but this is the lab this is the avionics lab in Denver so right there are, is the uh, engineering development units all the flight computers and they're actually cooled uh, on coal plates just like they would be in uh, in Orion this is the uh, communication and tracking booth, in a sense, shielded there. So we test all the phase array antennas and so forth in here. And then all these connections are, of course, all the EGSC that makes it work. So we run all the flight software there. It's fully functional now, and we're actually running all the performance cases uh, for EFT-1. And, and we're actually tied back to both Florida and MOD, where we're, they're tracking that, uh, the telemetry. Uh, we delivered the flight computer, so that's it. Um, they're standing next to it. They're not allowed to touch it there, but it's there. Uh, that's the crew that made it. So our flight computer's been delivered. These are uh, power distribution units. Um, they're not made of gold, actually. That's uh, aluminum uh, with a, uh, 
with some anodizing on it. These units, uh, we took the functions that would normally be distributed, your power system, your prop system, your, your ECLA system would normally have their own processors. But if you do that and you're flying to the moon, it's costing you a lot of power, a lot of mass. So we take those functions and synthesize them into these power distribution units. So it's a great idea for power and mass. It's a highly complex integration problem to take, and plus they're all different subcontractors, so we're taking those functions and bring them into these boxes. Um, uh, an example, one of these boxes has 16 cards. One of the cards has 3,000 parts on it. Think about capacitors, resistors, everything else. So they, it's a highly complex, uh, highly reliable system. Plus, the box has to be able to operate in a vacuum in case the cabin depresses. Plus, some of these have to uh, be submerged because you do an abort, the thing lands in the water, all the systems have to run anyway, right? So, you know, how hard can that be? So it's a great, it's a great uh, I think, example of the complexity in the work that has to be done to make these systems work. And those have all been delivered. Uh, we, we delivered two of them to the Cape, and the other, I think, are going to be shipped tomorrow. Uh, phased array antennas for Orion. So these are all done and on their way to be shipped also to the flight unit. Uh, the majority of our structures are composites. So this is the launch abort system structure here. Uh, it's been tested in Sunnyvale and is now complete. And these are the fairings for the service module that we tested in Sunnyvale. So a great test. We had, some, uh, we had some issues with one of the panels that we're fixing, and we'll redo that test in November. Um, something I think people don't recognize is we, uh, as Orion, as a government program, uh, we create and generate a lot of data that's useful for us, but we also provide it to the commercial crew providers because it helps them uh, in their systems, and they do not then have to recreate that data. So there's a lot of things relative to parachute testing that is directly applicable to them things relative to land landing, water landing studies that is directly applicable to them, as well as things like aerodynamic databases and so forth. So we provided hundreds of reports and test data uh, to the commercial crew provider. So it's just another offshoot of us doing exploration. We develop systems that they can use uh, to make it cheaper for them to provide the services we need to space station. Um, and then we were in the parade. There's the president, I think, astronauts <laughs> waving. You know, so it was exciting. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's where Ryan is today, and uh, I'll be looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. That was very good. Our next panelist will be Kathy Larini. She is the senior advisor within NASA headquarters, Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, where she is a leader in the development and implementation of strategies and plans for international partnerships in space exploration, better known as Global Exploration Roadmap. She also supports international space station program efforts to use the ISS to prepare for exploration. Since 2005, Kathy has been involved in NASA's human exploration effort, including roles as program manager for the human research program and project manager for Altair Human Lander Project. Uh, prior to that, she held leadership positions within the International Space Station program, including positions within systems engineering, payload integration, and on-orbit operations management. She also was a space shuttle flight controller. Kathy. Thank you, Don. Um, so with this presentation, I'm going to give you uh, an overview of the updated Global Exploration Roadmap, or GER as we call it, and, and its significance. Um, you know, the GER is an international roadmap of missions in the next 20 to 25 years, um, which, which, will, which demonstrates how the pieces come together or could come together to execute a compelling set of missions that tell a compelling story for, for human space exploration. It's the result of a, of a, of a work by a number of space agencies um, that reflects really the, the, the collaborative planning of, of our next steps in, in human space exploration. Um, and when I talk about this showing you how the pieces come together, the pieces I mean are the pieces like Orion and, and SLS, which you're, you're going to hear about today, but also the constraints in which we're living. So things like uh, affordability and the importance of the international partnership 
international partner. So hopefully what you'll see in this roadmap is, is a, and what you'll get from this presentation is an understanding of, of how these pieces and these constraints can be put together and really um, show a, a compelling story for, for the next 20 years of human exploration. So, so why did NASA and its partner agencies release this document? Why did we um, put effort into a, a nice glossy brochure and, and distribute it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the space agencies want to use it for uh, stakeholder engagement. You know, the, the, the fact is most of the human missions in the document are conceptual missions and need funding. Uh, commitments to realize these missions. So the fun foundational capabilities of, of Orion and SLS are there, but other capabilities will be required to realize these missions. And so the document provides a good basis for stakeholder engagement. And also the second reason why agencies went to the trouble of, of, of putting the document together and releasing it is to, is to stimulate discussions with the broader exploration community like the kinds of things that go on here this week to help make sure that the best ideas, uh, uh, good ideas are, are brought to bear in informing the planning of governments going forward. So, so that's what I'm going to try to do with this presentation. So the Global Exploration Roadmap is a product of a group called the ISEG, International Space Exploration Coordination Group. It really should be thought of as, as a number of agencies. And as, a, as the NASA lead to the effort, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm also the co-lead of the, of, the, of the team that produced the roadmap. Uh, so just an introduction, this is the cover, um, it was released, an updated version was released in, in August uh, last month. Um, it, it is a human space exploration roadmap, but it recognizes that exploring destinations where humans may someday live and work um, brings some natural synergies with robotic exploration. So asteroids, moon, Mars, there are there are scientific interests, robotic interests in these destinations, and it makes sense to build on these synergies. Yet, this is about human exploration and the unique role that humans play in, in, uh, in exploring. The document itself, when you read it, um, reflects not only the roadmap that I'm going to show you, but the uh, a framework of, of agency discussions that, that perform a good, provide a good underpinning to help us realize the roadmap, right? So we talk about common goals and objectives. We want to make sure that as a, as a set of agencies, we have enough commonality of our goals and objectives, both long-term and near-term, to make this a whole you know, collaboration effort worthwhile. We talk about the long-range mission scenario or the, or the, uh, the, the road map really itself um, and the architectures that would realize it. And lastly, we talk about um, near-term opportunities for collaboration, coordination, ways to leverage the money that we're all spending around the world to prepare for future missions. How can we make sure that money goes, goes the furthest and uh, create partnership opportunities along those lines? So main messages of the document, I hope if, if you've read it, what some of the main, main messages that you've taken away are, 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 are these, that, that sustainable human space exploration will be an international endeavor. I think Mark mentioned it, when we go to Mars, it will be international. And our, our partners, our partner agencies um, look forward to playing critical roles in, in Mars missions. And, and to build the robust, reliable capabilities that will enable those critical roles is, is what this, these next missions are, are about for many agencies. So as an international roadmap, it follows a path that enables multiple agencies to play critical path contributions. And that's what we're going to need in order to realize these, these uh, missions to Mars and, and, de and a robust, sustainable deep space exploration effort. Um, another big message from the document is that um, near-term missions in the lunar vicinity um, provide not only a great opportunity to demonstrate capabilities and their reliability, but also to execute compelling missions. So this is the part of, I, 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 I um, I mentioned in the beginning, we're trying to show that these capabilities um, can can be uh, brought to bear in, in a compelling manner to achieve a, a range of goals and objectives that are important over the long term for agencies, but also near term. Um, and so the mission, there's three mission themes that are defined in the document. The first one is the uh, exploring the near-Earth asteroid, and this is NASA's asteroid redirection mission. So bringing the asteroid back into the lunar vicinity and, and having the opportunity to explore it. And the document, is, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, extended duration missions in the crew vicinity. This set of missions is involve, involves early deployment of an evolvable deep space habitat in the, in the cis lunar space, so the crew can go and stand, spend extended duration times there to, to learn how to op, learn how to work and, and live uh, beyond the comfort of low Earth orbit 
test and integra integrated life support systems in a more in a, in a in an environment of deep space those kinds of things and lastly lunar surface missions you do see lunar surface missions in the roadmap so um, uh, getting the crew from the evolvable deep space hab which would serve as a staging post to the surface of the moon is an important opportunity for many agencies that, that haven't been to the surface of the moon not only to achieve high priority exploration objectives but also to demonstrate capabilities that would be contributed to to uh, to uh, to future missions so when when nasa rolled out the roadmap and announced that we were careful to say this roadmap doesn't imply that you know now we're ready to say we're going back to the moon but it does recognize that human space exploration will be international and and we, we know that and, and we have partners that not only have a desire to explore the moon but see the moon as a good way to advance capabilities and 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 as they um, use this document as as a tool to increase the, the support within their governments for funding contributions to lunar missions, NASA is certainly going to participate. We're not going to, you know, sit back and read about it in the news. In the news. It's part of our, our human space program, programs today are, are pretty intertwined, right? Where we go um, uh, building off of space station is someplace we'll go, we'll go together. So, uh, so we, um, we show lunar surface missions for, the, for that reason. Um, and, and lastly, you know, another message is there's, there's a lot of missions. It doesn't mean we're not, the, the roadmap isn't a, a monolithic program saying, you know, we should all sign an IGA and a set of MOUs to realize all of these things together. It's, it's a series of missions that some agencies will partner on some, some will partner on others, some will partner on certain capabilities like Orion, some will partner you know, in, in other capabilities. And, and the, 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 the partnerships that realize a roadmap such as this are going to be, uh, are going to be bilateral and multilateral. <coughs> So just to talk to now, now I'm going to set up the roadmap itself, the, the, scenario, the mission scenario, if you will, itself. Um, we say it responds to a long-range exploration strategy, a strategy that all agencies um, have, have embraced and one that was, we have embraced since the beginning of this road mapping mm -hmm. effort when the first GER was released a couple years ago. But the strategy is a, a common belief that you know, everything starts with ISS. It's the foundation of exploration. It's an incredibly important platform, not only for general research um, using its unique environment, and, uh, but it's also a, an excellent place to prepare for exploration, not only by doing research and technology demonstrations, but also to evolve the critical capabilities um, to uh, enable um, supporting more ambitious missions. So starting with ISS, expanding human presence into the solar system with a long-term goal of, of humans on the surface of Mars. Um, Mars is an easy, easy goal for everybody to agree to long term. We use it as a driving goal in the near term. The roadmap doesn't go all the way to Mars, but as a common driving goal, um, it's very useful. Uh, and so the strategy also includes the, some, we call them driving principles, but these are key strategic principles that were the result of a lot of discussion within agencies that, um, that, that basically reflect the environments we're all in today, and it reflects what we believe are the characteristics of, a, of not only a sustainable program, but a program that our governments will want to invest in. So things like affordability. Um, making, you know, if, if we, if we um, pr propose a road map that requires everybody's human space flight budget to be doubled, it's probably not going to be a realistic road map. Um, so keep in mind that there are, there are budget constraints that we're going to have to live with. Um, value to stakeholders, delivering benefits, this is essentially important. It's a key driver to all of our stakeholders around the world is, is we invest in space to bring benefits to people on Earth and agencies have, uh, have the ability to deliver these benefits with everything they do from not only executing the missions, but the preparation for the missions, the, from you know, exposing kids to uh, you know, an astronaut training session or, or, or technologies that are used uh, that may never fly that, 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 that can be applied elsewhere on the ground. There's things that we, we do that, that drive benefits. We need to be keenly aware that, that we, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's an important obligation we have and, and whatever we do needs to respect that. The international partnerships, um, as, as I said, you know, our human spaceflight programs today are, are intertwined with, uh, with the space station. And as we go forward, we're planning collaboratively for what we do next. Um, uh, the, the, the important uh, a, a partnership will be successful if there are 
critical and early and visible roles for, for all the partners. So trying to find ways that, um, that not only build on the partnership, but, but uh, uh, offer opportunities for the partnership to increase as we go forward is important. Um, capability evolution is, we talk about it a lot in the U.S. as capability driven. Capability evolution is, is the same thing. It's how we refer to it in the international community, but it means a, a stepwise development evolution of capabilities. Don't, don't look at what you need for, for, uh, for Mars and then sit down and design it. Recognize you're going to get there best by, uh, by evolving the capabilities that you have today. And, um, and enabling a greater set of missions to be accomplished along the way. So the stepwise provision, building on the capabilities that everybody has. The, the human robotic partnership, I mentioned it before, but it's something that's very important to keep in mind and to keep looking for meaningful opportunities. You know, it's, it's important and it's, it's hard if you're on the robotic side, um, you know, science side, you've got funding for missions and you've got well-established processes that involve peer review and, and decision making. and. And, uh, and now these human guys that don't really have anything but long-term dreams want to talk to you about specific collaboration initiatives. You know, you, you got to find the real value-added uh, um, opportunities for building the synergy and collaboration. Um, everybody, both sides know it's there, but finding the right ways to do it, to pursue it, is, is, what, we're, is, um, is what we're trying to promote. And lastly, robustness. So it was, it's, it's another, it's the way in this community we, we, we say resilience, as, as you heard in the panel before here. But it, it basically means recognize that, uh, that things are going to happen, partnerships are going to change, create an open architecture where, where, uh, where you can, and a robust architecture where you can, you can deal with inevitable um, you know, failures along the way. And you don't have to, a, a global space exploration program doesn't come to a halt if, if one launch fails. You have a, you have a robustness towards uh, uh, robustness to, uh, to failures that are going to happen and, and to partnerships that are going to change along the way. So this is the, uh, the mission scenario or, or roadmap of, as I've alluded to it. And you can see this, the common strategy reflected in it, starting with ISS um, in low Earth orbit and leading to ultimately human exploration of Mars in the lower right-hand corner. So ISS, as I mentioned, critically important for, for doing the, the preparatory activities that, that, uh, that will bring risks of humans going further to a, an acceptable level. Um, the, the, the international community also recognizes that, that what ISS is doing is demonstrating, hopefully, the long-term viability of LEO as a place to be, a place to operate, whether for... for for making money, for doing research, for sending tourists. There will be a reason to be in LEO um, long after ISS, and that's a good thing. Um, and then uh, on the way to Mars, there's a beyond low Earth orbit. As you, step, as you take steps um, beyond low Earth orbit, you see the, the three main human destinations, near-Earth objects, the Moon and Mars in their colored boxes. But within the lunar vicinity, um, <coughs> There are other uh, is, a, is a physical domain where other missions will take place. So near Neo, you see the uh, the NASA asteroid redirection mission starts out with a robotic spacecraft to to redirect an asteroid back to a place where where humans can explore it. Uh, then the lunar then then you see those missions are are leading into and uh, informing and also followed by some missions in the lunar vicinity to uh, to an evolvable deep space hub, which is initially deployed. To, into cislunar space and one that can allow the crew to go for increasingly longer durations, um, do things like perhaps a human-assisted sample return, uh, lunar sample, perhaps even a Mars sample, um, and uh, providing uh, a, uh, a, a, a serving as a staging post for later human access to the surface of the moon. So the idea being that uh, um, with an architecture like this, you more simulate a, a, a Mars mission architecture as well. So the kinds of capabilities that partners are, are advancing and demonstrating in an architecture like this will be better, will, will play forward um, in a more applicable manner for future Mars missions. Uh, then once you've done these, these three mission themes of uh, of the asteroid mission, the extended duration crew missions, and the humans to the lunar surface. Then your then uh, sustainable missions into the towards the Mars system are 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 possible. And as I mentioned, we didn't didn't um, 
you know, go all the way out there recognizing that technologies will, will, will affect how you go and, uh, and, and discoveries along the way will affect how and when you go. And maybe when you get to the moon, you decide you want to stay there. There's a reason to stay. So there's a lot of things that in the future don't need to be prescriptively uh, outlined. But in the next 20, 25 years, this is, uh, this is a good roadmap. And you see, you see the capabilities. You see when we talk about capability driven, capability evolution, what we mean. Uh, uh, an Orion can be used for not only the near-Earth asteroid exploration, but it can be used for, for missions in the lunar vicinity and ultimately missions to Mars. And, and evolvable deep space hab that you would demonstrate in the lunar vicinity then advances your, your life support and your, uh, your habitation systems, which you're going to need to no matter what architecture you take on your way to Mars, you're going to need to keep the crew alive on the way. Uh, so then it, you'll all, we also spend some time documenting each of, or, or describing each of the three mission themes. So the, the near-Earth asteroid exploration, you'll hear more about that tomorrow, so I won't go through it. But this is NASA's, NASA's mission, and, and, uh, uh, and we're hoping to get international partners um, to, to, uh, to, to join with us in this, uh, in this exciting next step. The extended duration crew missions, you see how these capabilities, the Orion, and a Russian piloted system could could um, uh, support uh, the missions to this evolvable deep space hab, the kinds of things that you can do, the contribution that this, these missions will make to Mars mission readiness. This is all part of the story that's told in, in the GER. And lastly, the humans to the lunar surface. So you see by um, augmenting with a lunar, a lunar surface access and, and robotic cargo delivery capability, the kinds of activities you can do on the surface of the moon and the contribution that, that these missions would make to Mars mission readiness. So th this is a chart that we hope kind of replaces the one from the original GER. You saw the two pathways, you know, moon next, asteroid next, the theme from the first GER. Um, with this unified plan, we hope that it is really the big step in, uh, in, in advancing our, our, our international planning effort and, and, and focuses in on really these big themes of ISS and the importance of ISS, the ro robotic missions that are happening and the real opportunity that they provide to discover and prepare, and then the human missions beyond low Earth orbit and, and how each one of these in the, uh, in, in the lunar vicinity prepare you to go further towards the, the, destination, the ultimate goal of humans sustainably to the surface of Mars. So in conclusion, uh, I'll, I'll just reiterate. So with, this, with, a, do, with a document like this, uh, all the participating agencies can, um, can help stimulate and inform internal studies and internal stakeholder discussions on, on what possible role they could play and how near-term and potential future contributions will help play a role in, in help them play a role in enabling uh, future missions to Mars. Um, the, the GR articulates the, the benefits of space exploration, not in a very um, elaborate way, but just to help reiterate to everybody in, in this community the importance of, of delivering benefits um, and, and understanding how to best communicate the benefits that we expect through these missions. Um, uh, just to help us with our with our stakeholder advocacy efforts, right? I think um, uh, the better we're all able to uh, to communicate expected future benefits, the better we're all able to to get the funding and longer term support that's needed to support these uh, these kinds of missions. Um, so benefits like knowledge that uh, uh, that we have gained from past missions. Um, has driven not only scientific but technological innovations that contributes to new po products and services on Earth. So when you explore, you learn things, and these, this information uh, is, uh, it really benefits people on Earth through, through its, its application in, in not only space-based services but other services. Um, the cultural and inspirational aspect, aspect um, to people on Earth, you know, the, the, the Apollo 8 image of the Earth, the, the modern day equivalent from the Kaguya of, of Earth from the, the, the horizon of the moon, just show you um, how the, uh, the, the exploration of space and the intangible impact that it has on, on, on creating future innovators and, and future scientists and engineers. 
and then uh, overcoming the, the, the partnership aspect. So as we work to overcome the challenges that, uh, that are there in exploring space, um, we build the partnerships um, that allow us to, to, uh, to know each other but, and trust each other better, but also um, have the partnership, have the capabilities to solve global problems in a, in a global way. Uh, so, l lastly, I just want to reiterate that, that NASA, as well as our partner agencies, remain committed to using this document as a way to stimulate discussion with the broader community on, you know, what, what's, what's good that's in here and what, what can be improved and how can we um, take the best ideas out there to really inform the, the strategic planning effort. Um, you know, the, the, the time is now to, to collaboratively plan with our partners. Um, uh, who are uh, you know key stakeholders in this activity and uh, and a document like this and engagement with the with the international broader space community is something everybody's interested in doing and uh, and we we like with the first roadmap we're sure that that, that engagement will will uh, will make the next version of the next iteration of the document even stronger and hopefully the one that has all the government signatures on it um, so we can go do all these uh, exciting missions. So um, thanks and I'll look forward to your questions. Thanks, Ken. Thank you, Kathy, that was very good. Our next speak, our panelist will be Todd May. He is the uh, manager of the Space Launch System Program Office located at Marshall. The Space Launch System is slated for its first mission in 2017 and will be the nation's next heavy lift vehicle for human and scientific exploration of deep space destinations such as Mars. Previously, Todd was Marshall's technical associate director over the Science and Mission Systems Office. He also put in his time at headquarters as Deputy Associate Administrator in the Science Mission Directorate. He has completed coursework at Auburn for his doctorate degree in material science. And Todd, status on SLS. Thanks, Don. Uh, it's good to be here today. Um, I spent the morning up at JPL and, and uh, drove down with a colleague and as we we came over the hill today and saw the ocean for the first time since I've, I've been here. Um, we saw the Star of India and uh, it's, it was kind of cool. We got to drive up next to it and see a ship that has sailed all the way around the world. And um, I tend to think of space exploration uh, as building a ship and as what we're doing is ship building. And so it's great to be down here in a port city and see that. Uh, also to see an aircraft carrier to remind us that uh, there are still strategic reasons to build ships. Uh, and then I saw the Dole ship down here, and uh, it reminded me that uh, ships of transportation uh, are not getting smaller, they're actually getting larger. That, that one looks like maybe your second or third generation. Uh, the cross-section on the newer sixth generation ones now are about five times that. Um, and so if we're going to move out into space and we're going to move things around, um, we're going to need uh, big transportation to do that. So I want to talk to you today about what we're doing on that front. Uh, Kathy covered, uh, I thought very well, the, the Global Exploration Roadmap. This is uh, kind of a way that, that we've been talking about rationalizing uh, where we find ourselves the, these days uh, in with respect to human space flight. And, uh, and, and I kind of like to, to use it in a way to differentiate the various regimes of, of space um, we spent the last 20 years uh, assembling the, the International Space Station and uh, Mark Geyer and I, the first time I ever worked for Mark was on the International Space Station. Uh, the workhorse to get that up there uh, was the space shuttle. And, and in 2011, we retired that. Uh, and now the space station is up and running. And as Sam's going to come up here and talk to us, that exploration kind of starts with that. And, uh, and, and all the things we do there, all the science, all the international relationships we've already established there, uh, can be fully utilized. Um, but the space station is, is only about 200 miles away from Earth, give or take 100 miles, uh, as Suffordini likes to tell me. Um, and so what we're doing, and one of our charters as, as what we do here, is to bring commerce behind us. It's, it's actually written in the, uh, the original uh, NASA charter that, that we bring commerce along. And, 
just like the explorers of the 16th and 17th century uh, who set foot out there alone, uh, behind them came commerce. And, uh, and the explorers who, who trekked out um, in places that no one had ever been, if you were to look at the ship tracks across the world now, uh, you, you would not even be able to see the ocean for all the ship tracks that go across there. And so now, uh, as you heard uh, in the last panel, we're bringing on an armada of commercial crew and cargo capabilities to service the International Space Station. Uh, it's a great bulwark up there uh, in space from which we can foster that environment. And NASA is going out, and, and I, again, it's football season, so NASA is going out for the post pattern. We want to go deep again. Uh, Kennedy called space uh, the new ocean. And so we want to go out deep into the, into the islands of space, and, and Kathy talked to you about those places. We're talking orders of magnitude. If you look out there, Mark mentioned that, that the moon is three orders of magnitude further than low Earth orbit. You go out um, another order of magnitude uh, to get to the asteroids we're looking at, another order of magnitude to get to Mars, uh, and then another order of magnitude uh, to, to the moons of Jupiter. Um, and so we're really talking um, the deep space game here. And I, and I mentioned uh, to you that we differentiate a little bit from the current commercial market. You can almost see a dividing line down the middle of the page here. Um, the capability we're talking about building is really back to an exploration class uh, launch vehicle. And, and it takes uh, a large launch vehicle to explore into, into deep space. And so, uh, and so we're, we're, on, we're on our way to do that. I won't talk this chart in too much detail. Mark's already talked the right side of it, and I think John Elbon showed a version of this uh, in the previous panel. But if you don't know, SLS is made up of, of some major pieces here. Uh, the SSMEs from the orbiter have been repurposed to RS-25s uh, down at the bottom of the rocket. Those are our, our liquid engines for the core. Uh, you see the core of the rocket. That is uh, the brains and the backbone and the structure, uh, two very large tanks there as well. That's, uh, that's Boeing. All of our liquid engines are uh, Aerojet rocket, rocket dyne these days. Uh, you see the two solid rocket boosters. Those are essentially the, um, the shuttle boosters uh, lengthened to five segments instead of four. And then above that, you see an adapter. Um, and then we made use of a Delta IV upper stage for the initial capability. And then above that is uh, an adapter that uh, we actually provide uh, to Mark for the first flight in EFT-1, but we also use it as part of our EM-1 flight. Uh, to connect the Orion uh, stack. So uh, Mark had his uh, magical mystery tour chart. I'd call this Penny Lane. It's, <laughs> it's a lot shorter. And, uh, and uh, we feel like um, we're working at a pretty fast clip here. Um, we're, we're, we're treating this development, um, my, one of my previous lives was to manage the Discovery of New Frontiers program. And I got a lot of exposure to what we call planetary missions. Uh, these missions are cost capped and they have a planetary window by which you're supposed to get this thing off the ground. And, uh, and we're moving at about that pace. Uh, we formally rolled out in September of 2011 and in only 21 months we've, we've uh, succeeded in producing a, a preliminary design review including uh, all the preliminary design reviews for the components that uh, feed up into the main uh, vehicle itself. The core, which was the critical path, achieved there. Uh, preliminary design review five months earlier than planned. Um, so we've we really pushed everything back to the left. Um, and so now uh, we're in the process of taking all that technical data, rolling it up with um, uh, the programmatic data and heading towards what we call key decision point C, uh, which is an agency milestone where we uh, make our commitments externally in terms of delivering uh, to a cost and a schedule. Um, as we move into um, the rest of this year, um, things are going very well down at Mishu. Our critical path hardware-wise actually flows through the buildup of the core, and we've got four of the five major tools already installed in producing hardware, uh, and you'll see a picture on the next page. The, the fifth one um, actually uh, is going to be the tallest welder ever built. It, it, it will have a 2, two million-pound uh, head on it, 165 feet tall, and will have placement accuracy to a thousandths of an inch. Um, this thing is uh, really interesting in terms of what you have to do for a foundation. Um, the tallest building down in New Orleans is the, is the Shell One building. The foundation for this tool is as strong as the foundation for that entire building. So if you ever want to build the, the next tallest building in New Orleans, uh, we know where you can put it. 
Um, the tool itself, uh, that fifth tool, is actually uh, going very well. Um, they've been doing a lot of confidence um, testing of the tool itself. They've passed the 100% design and gotten it uh, pieces put together. Um, the, the, we've had a little bit of a trouble, um, on, and, and it's been a critical path thing that we've been watching on the uh, actual drilling uh, to put the pylons in, and, uh, and now we're, we're actually, to make some of that up, we're actually pouring concrete around the clock. Um, as we move into uh, next year, Mark mentioned the EFT-1 flight coming up. Uh, we've been doing a series of tests on the J2X engine, uh, including all its paces at reduced um, power and uh, gimbling tests and things like that. We've also been testing, uh, if you listened to the last panel, there was some discussion around selective laser melting. We actually have uh, some of the first ever uh, made uh, selective laser melting parts on the engine itself, and we're, we're testing those out to prove that you, you actually can take something off off of one of these machines and put it in the an engine and, you, and fire it. Um, ICPS for this flight actually production begins in 2014. Uh, we're heading into the uh, booster qualifierings uh, late this year and into next year. Um, and then we start um, putting together the pieces of the core. Um, and some of those are already coming off. Uh, I was down at Michoud last week and we got the first segment, the first core uh, barrel section. And, and this thing is 20 feet, uh, 27 and a half feet in diameter and over 20 feet tall. And when you stand next to it, it's, it's maybe as big as, as, you know, this area right in here. And you realize that seven of those stacked up makes a core um, because you got seven of those. And then you got end caps on either one of those in the inner tank. So the equivalent of 10 of those uh, make the actual core height. And you start to get a sense of the scale of, of what we're talking about. Um, as we head into late in the year, we're, uh, we're building the structural test articles at Marshall right now for all those major pieces, the oxygen tank, the hydrogen tank, the inner tank, and the aft structure. Um, those things uh, are coming together well as well. They've all achieved 100% uh, design review. Um, and then uh, as we assemble that uh, core stage, we head down to Stennis in 2016 and we do a, a core stage full uh, mission firing there on the B2 stand. Had a chance to see that. The, the work um, on the B2 stand is actually also coming along well and under cost. Um, and so um, that, that part of it's going along real well. Uh, and then the booster flight segment starts showing up at KSC. Uh, we start sending the rest of the vehicle down there and then we kind of hand it over to our uh, ground systems development office uh, brethren who uh, assemble the vehicle and get ready to fly. So uh, I've talked about a little bit of this. Uh, I did get a chance to see the J2X fire last week. It's a, it's a clean engine, uh, got to full mission power and uh, full mission duration and order of magnitude less tests than we've ever gotten to with an engine before. Uh, ATK is, is doing well. They've gone through two sets of flight software tests on the, uh, the TVC and the control systems for um, the boosters. Um, the core stage, uh, as I mentioned, uh, went through PDR. Uh, well ahead of schedule last December, um, and, and I've been watching very closely the drawing release metric. Um, Boeing has achieved over 200 drawings a month for the last three months in a row. If they keep that up for another eight months, they'll be at critical design uh, maturity by next June. Um, let's see, uh, you can see there, there's a picture of the barrel weld so you get a sense of the scale we're talking about, and honestly, it's like the Grand Canyon. You can look at all the pictures you want, but until you stand up next to one of those, you really don't get a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, I mentioned the adapter up in the top uh, right there. That's, uh, that's an, we actually have two of those now. We've actually taken the, uh, uh, and mated that thing up to a, a Delta IV um, stage there to make sure it's gonna fit on the ICPS. Um, we're preparing to uh, the stand uh, to, to start doing RS-25 testing. We're actually gonna uh, start putting some RS-25s in the stand next spring. Uh, in the advanced development world, uh, you see here, this is a picture of some of the work we're doing with the F1 engine. We actually got um, a, a part out of the Smithsonian and, uh, and took a gas generator and fired it. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the sense of scale of, a, of an F1, just the gas generator of that's the equivalent um, power of an RL10 engine. Um, and then down at the bottom right, I mentioned SCNI and I and the, the PDR we pulled off. Gary Lyles is our chief engineer has done an exceptional job, I would say a phenomenal job managing the integration of the vehicle um, and, and pulling off a, a great PDR. Um, I'll tell you, just to be frank, we, we didn't get off without any um, what we call review item discrepancies out of the, 
out of the PDR, um, but, but I will say it's an order of magnitude less than what we've dealt with in the past. Uh, I worked the Mantena Capability PDR for Space Station. We had over 3,000 RIDs. Um, I think on uh, Ares we had several thousand RIDs. We, we had 150 RIDs uh, on this, and we had over 700 people review the data. Um, this was a clean data pack. It was over 15 gigabytes of data, um, and so um, it, 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 the vehicle uh, is very stable. We do have some issues, and, and I'll, be, I'll speak fairly freely about them. Uh, we have some loads issues. Um, one of the things is that we're using heritage hardware. That was a way to avoid development costs. Uh, but when you use those in a new environment, um, they actually become constraints on the systems engineering process. And so one of the things we had to do uh, was not flow down some of the loads that we were getting out of the DAC-2 uh, to the elements to give us a chance to work on those. And I'm pleased to report some of, the, some of the biggest issues we were seeing, we've actually gotten back into the wind tunnel now and have fairly simple design fixes. Um, for example, uh, where the uh, booster's attached to the core, we had some transonic buffet going on where it flutters. Um, we've actually been able to go back into the wind tunnel with three separate designs, one of which is as simple as putting a small fin above it. Um, and we've done sensitivities around it that show that just sticking that fin on there solves that problem. Uh, another problem is lateral loads on things like the ICPS and on Orion itself. It turns out if you put a vehicle stabilizer on the rocket and don't drop it until T0, you can get rid of a lot of those issues. Uh, we had some acoustic issues in some areas. It, it turns out that uh, doing some more analysis there, we've kind of isolated that down to the inner tank region. Um, and it looks like we can just put some isolators on some of the boxes to take care of some of that. We can put some blankets in the LVSA and the ICPS area um, to mitigate that. So these are not uh, huge insurmountable problems considering that we're frankly building the most rock powerful rocket ever built. Um, let's see, um, the engines, the RS-25s were designed for the shuttle. Um, it turns out that uh, uh, our um, LOX has delivered um, much more efficiently than the orbiter uh, and the external tank system did uh, to the engines, so the, it actually uh, arrives a little too cold, and so we've got to figure out how we're going to slow that down, or we may even have to put heaters on the downcomers, to, which is something that doesn't make sense, right? You cool it down and then you heat it back up before you put it in the engine, but, um, you know, those are things we're going to deal with, and, and they're not huge issues. Um, let's see. Um, and you may have heard last week we're dealing with an issue on the boosters themselves. We've... Uh, when we were pouring the fifth segment on the first qual motor, uh, we had an, a void in between the insulation and the, uh, the propellant, and uh, it wasn't something we had seen before. We had actually done three uh, previous motors, and, uh, and we thought uh, we kind of got down a, a trail of chasing the, uh, the particular uh, material changes, and, uh, and so we, we thought we had figured out what it was. We went back and poured, and we got almost the exact same thing. If you were to look at the signatures, you, you see it's almost like somebody just copied the picture down. And so we obviously didn't uh, find out what it was. Um, we use very detailed x-ray and ultrasonic techniques. That's what, they're, that's what they're there for. They're supposed to drive this stuff out. Um, so we have team, uh, uh, teams from uh, around the country um, descending now on this problem and solving it. And, and I guarantee you we're going we're gonna to whip this thing. Uh, it's not on the critical path. Um, it's it's not near the critical path. It's something that we can we can deal with, and uh, it's not something I personally am, am too worried about. And neither is Gary. So uh, those are really the, the the issues that that we see right now coming up. Um, none of those are keeping me up at night. Um, I would say the the largest uh, um, issue is more of a programmatic thing, and it's around the budget, um, and and frankly around budget uncertainty. Um, and, and you heard some discussion in the previous panel. I think uh, Bill Gerstemeyer said it uh, correctly that uh, um, it's one of those things where um, it's, it's tight. It's always tight. This is a large major development. Uh, being a, a Navy town, we know about Rick over here, and he talked about real reactors and paper reactors. Um, we're building a real big rocket here, and, and this is hard. But, I, but I'll tell you, this isn't my first program, and, and every planetary mission I've ever worked on was tight. There never seemed to be enough time or enough money to do it. But um, out of that necessity and knowing that this is what we have to do becomes innovation. And I'll tell you, we're, so far we have met the challenge. Um, we've done everything we can do to keep this thing on track, 
and uh, and I will tell you that that I cannot be more proud uh, of the team of, of and a lot of you um, have folks a lot of you are out, out here have folks working on this team I, across the board these folks are, are rising to meet every occasion um, so we're doing our part um, and we just have to wait and, and let the appropriations process work itself out. I will tell you, I've been at this program now for just under three years, and every year, um, it, when all said and done, we've got what we needed to get uh, get the job done. So uh, I'm here to tell you we're on track for 17, um, and we'll see. We'll see how things work out. So I think with that, um, I'll get off the stage. Thanks. Good job. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Todd. That was great. Our final panelist is Sam Sanimi. He is the director on the ISS program. He's had 27 years at NASA as both a contractor and civil servant. He's worked on a broad spectrum of programs, including shuttle, ISS, SOFIA, NPP, and others. He's also moved around a lot more than I realized he's had a broad experience across the entire NASA, JSC, Ames, Goddard, and currently at headquarters. He has a BS in mechanical engineering from McNeese State University. Sam? Thanks, Tom. Um, since Todd brought up boats, uh, if anyone's interested, the uh, lady Christine that's parked right here at the super yacht, it's on sale for a cool $45 million. That's $10 million off the list price. And it does come with your own private helicopter, so uh, get your bids in today. Uh, <laughs> I looked it up. <laughs> I looked it up. Um, just wanted to remind everybody, while we're all here um, lounging around in San Diego, uh, we've got a crew that's just about to get off a of space station. Um, the hooks have been open on the Soyuz. And uh, they're about to push off in, in the next, I guess, couple of minutes, uh, if, if they have not done that already. Uh, they're landing in Kazakhstan uh, this evening, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, San Diego time. So if, uh, hopefully, if people are still at the happy hour, maybe uh, the uh, facility folks here can get that landing here on the on video. Um, Today I'm here to talk to you about uh, the space station and, and, and the larger role that it plays in NASA and, and the country. And uh, let's see, this, this a pointer thing? Well, it used to work until you broke it. Oh, laser. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's why I don't push any buttons on the station, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk to you about the state of progress uh, of, of the goals we have for space station. Uh, not only NASA's goal, but uh, goals for the country. Uh, if you look at all the missions that space stations, um, I would say, uh, is carrying, uh, uh, you can break them down into four major categories. First is the advancement of benefits to humanity through research. Second is to enable a commercial driven market in, in low Earth orbit. Thirdly, to enable long duration human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit and onto Mars. And Lastly, to be the basis for international cooperation and exploration. Space Station is a, as many of you know, has, been, had, has had a long and storied history uh, about its, uh, uh, the way it was built, uh, the uh, fights over its configuration and the length and all. But I believe this is the right space station. And the reason why it's the right space station to accomplish all these goals, because it got built. This is the one we could build, and this is the one we did build. Many of the people here on this table were involved in it. I'm sure many people here in the audience uh, have been involved in this program. And it is finally complete. And now we're in the phase of actually utilizing it, not only its uh, capabilities, but the partnership itself, uh, it, the simulation environment it, it provides for going beyond low Earth orbit, and everything else that go goes along with human spaceflight. First, let's talk a little bit about uh, the benefits to humanity. Just to set things up for folks to get people an idea of what it takes to do real research. In the aerospace community, we, we're not really geared for this kind of research that we're doing on, on board the space station. That's really for the research guys, the scientist guys. Uh, so we've had a really hard time in, in the space station program trying to explain what it takes to do research. 
Uh, I think we're getting a lot better at it, but taking a quote from the Irish author, Tana uh, French, is, you know, time works so hard for us, only if we can let it. We're so impatient. We want smoke and fire now. We want results now. But in the research world, that just doesn't happen. Uh, and these, uh, I've got some um, uh, uh, time scales here. These aren't just NASA's time scales. These are time scales for research in, in general. For instance, for, to complete a study in orbit is two weeks to, to five plus years. Uh, time from uh, completion of a study in orbit to, to the first professional publication or, or scientific publication, one to three years for a majority of investigations. And then time for publication to a patent, anywhere from three years for like technology to 20 years for, pharm for the pharmaceutical industry. So we're not talking time frames that we normally deal with uh, in, do in, in accomplishing goals uh, in our community. Now to give a, a little perspective on human spaceflight, from the 37 years or so from Skylab to assembly complete, there's only been about one and a half years of productive microgravity research in space. That's not a, terribly a lot of time. And if you compare that to the previous chart, oops, to the previous chart, we're just barely scratching the surface on, on, re, on research. And you can see when we first started with Skylab, we were just really in the exploration phase and learning what the microgravity environment was. And then we started doing survey studies of, of how it affects biology, phys the physical sciences, medical sciences, and the, and the like. And now that assembly is complete, we can actually take what we've learned and apply that to application and to, be to, to benefit people on Earth and also to help us uh, in exploring uh, the solar system as well. Uh, if station gets extended uh, beyond 2020, we'll accomplish 85% more research on, on board the station on the internal ex experiments. You see here is uh, where station would end today in our current policy. If policy extends space station, the area under the curve here, you see, we uh, nearly uh, come up doubling the amount of, of research we could do inside the space station. Similarly for crew time, we more than double crew time. Here's 2020 today, and with addition of commercial crew and the fourth crew member, uh, we can actually double the amount of crew time available for crew, crew research if station is extended. We're also researching other uh, models for increments. Right now we have six month uh, uh, crew increments. We're uh, looking today at, at alternate mo models for that. It has some implications for the human research program, but we're also exploring different models with them as well. Um, Today, we have a requirement to do at least 35 hours of, of crew time for research. This last uh, couple of increments, we've uh, averaged uh, 40 hours a week, and our predictions for the upcoming in increment is 42 hours a week. So we're really doing uh, really well. We've learned how to optimize uh, crew time for research instead of crew time for maintenance. So we've really learned how to balance the two and, and shift the balance to utilization instead of, you know, the, 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 the upkeep in, of, of the station itself. Some upcoming research activities. Uh, there's a whole bunch of upcoming research activities. I've highlighted the, some of the more dramatic ones and ones that's taken a lot of, a lot of our effort. Uh, we're creating a new capability to fly rodents on, on board the space station, especially for medical and, and, and biomedical uh, research. Uh, that's going to be on SpaceX 4. That'll be an, be an exploratory a demonstration uh, a mission for <laughs> on SpaceX. I couldn't say that word. Uh, and on, on, on the next SpaceX, we'll actually start doing more applied. Uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry is quite interested in, in this capability uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, we are now pursuing with cases and exploring that, the opportunities with the pharmaceutical industry to be able to use uh, this, this capability. We'll prove that it works on SpaceX 4 and then we'll go, we'll go from there. Um, uh, many of you may have heard we've had some ocular health issues that we've uh, found out on space station uh, with, our, with our crews. Uh, we now have started uh, research programs specifically on that, especially looking towards long duration missions of a year and more. So that, that's now beginning. Uh, we've just started uh, this year for our one, uh, to do the research and planning for our one year crew mission in 2015. So that's going well with our Russian partners. Uh, we're also engaging our other partners to see if they want to do research uh, uh, on, on this program. Our first CASIS only sponsored payloads are coming up on SpaceX 3. 
and uh, Orbital One, and this is going to focus on an NRA that they put out on uh, protein crystal growth. And just some of the, the technology development in Earth and space science missions we're flying on the space station. Uh, HDEV, which is a uh, Earth viewing high def camera. Uh, OPALS is right here at JPL. Uh, it's a laser comm uh, demonstration. Uh, Rapid SCAT is a, uh, a sea winds follow on. It measures uh, sea winds and, and ocean uh, wave height. Uh, uh, CREAM is an astrophysics uh, uh, instrument. And uh, Sage 3 is, an, is another uh, uh, earth science uh, instrument. Uh, these are just some of them. There's a whole lot more. We've partnered with uh, SMD to fly uh, earth and space science uh, instruments on board space stations. So uh, many of our external uh, 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 attach points are being filled up with uh, earth and space science in instruments. We're also working with STMD with, with technology development uh, activities as well. There's a whole lot of research that's going on board space station. I could spend, you know, quite a couple of hours talking to you about them. I'm only going to research, uh, 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 explain a couple of them. One, which was, uh, uh, all these were presented at the ISS Research and Development Conference that was held in Denver uh, back in, a couple of months ago. One is this complex plasma applications. Research aboard space station on complex plasma, it's also called dusty plasma. Um, it builds plasma crystals out of the air, and it's found through clinical trials on the earth that it significantly uh, advances the healing of wounds on, on, on people and animals and the like. It also significantly reduces the size of uh, cancerous tumors. It also, it's, it's just an amazing thing that, that was uh, uh, recently uh, presented and, and is in literature now. It also uh, um, kills uh, drug-resistant bacteria. Uh, and it also can be used in planetary protection. You can take a whole spacecraft and sort of irradiate it with this dusty plasma and it'll kill all the microorganisms uh, uh, on the spacecraft. Uh, this is going to go to FDA, uh, to go to FDA license, and soon, uh, in the next few years, a handful of years, you'll be able to go to CVS Pharmacy, buy a tube that ionizes air and into, this, in, into these special uh, uh, crystal structures and put on a wound without having any medicine on it. It will heal a whole lot faster. So that's what they're working towards. That's just one example of the research that, that is, uh, I've been going on on the space station. The other one I'll, I'll, I'll uh, highlight on is one you may, may have heard already, uh, is the uh, um, bone loss and microgravity research we're doing in the HRP program. Uh, it's now been uh, demonstrated and proven that through exercise, um, medication, and uh, diet, we can mitigate the long duration effects of bone loss. On, on our crew members. Uh, this has significant implications for osteoporosis uh, research here on the ground. And uh, with our one year crew coming up and hopefully more others will apply that same research to the, the one year crew for long duration space flight. Uh, since we, now that we've proven this, this is a one big risk uh, mitigator for us going uh, beyond low earth orbit for long duration missions. Talk about uh, commercial industry. Um, w space station, as, as you've heard in other, uh, other uh, presentation, is, is um, enabling a, a commercial demand for low Earth orbit transportation, especially as, you've, as many people know here in uh, c cargo and crew. But you, look, you, you, you span out, look at the larger transportation system to space station, we are 57% of the non-geo market. Uh, we're about half that in the total market. And, and, and launches. This is actually unprecedented in the, in the history of spaceflight, where you have all these launch vehicles, you know, 14 to 15 a year going to a single destination. It's, 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 it's unprecedented. We are coming up with new ways to use that transportation system. For instance, we've had a plethora of requests to host payloads that aren't NASA's, that aren't human spaceflight, that belong to other organizations, to host their payloads on our spacecraft going to space station either going to space station or deploying them. Also, we're thinking of new ways to use these spacecraft. Uh, for instance, uh, later part of this, this decade, we'll be purposely burning up and starting a large fire 
on the Cygnus vehicle actually com coming back uh, to see how uh, a, a large fire behaves in space and actually how to put it out. We've actually never done that. We've always done a controlled, very small fire to do, to do our research. This will be the first large-scale fire in space. The, an extension of space station would also greatly enhance the viability of uh, commercial crew uh, uh, in industry. Uh, with station ending in 2020, uh, as you can see, we'd get less than one or two, well, about one or two years of contracted flights. And we'd only have less than nine years of, of commercial use of the space station. Extended it beyond 2020, hopefully to its, at least to its certified life, you get 10 years of crewed flights and more than 17 years of, of commercial utilization. Our intent with the, with the space station program, one of its primary goals is to establish a commercial demand th that is non-government in nature. The government will probably still have requirements in low Earth orbit, but we're trying to make the demand a non-government demand, and the space station is how we're going to do that. Which actually leads to this chart is, is sort of graphically uh, uh, shows that through the operation and utilization of station, and, and not only in NASA's requirements, but in the commercial world, that we're able to spawn off a commercially viable platform in low Earth orbit, and NASA gets out of the business of not only transportation, but actually providing a uh, low Earth orbit uh, platform. Now on to Mars. Um, remember this from Kathy's uh, presentation. Uh, remember, we're back here. Uh, being the cornerstone of human space flight and how we get beyond low Earth orbit to, to Mars and other destinations. So where are we today in human space flight? Well, we've got a long way to go. Uh, we talked about before, uh, Mars is several orders of magnitude away from where we are today, a really long way. And the only link to, for a Mars mission is a comm link. That's all we have. And it's up to 42 minutes round trip. And the shortest missions that we can come up with is approximately one year and all the way up to three years. So basically, we'd have to recreate living on Earth, which has actually never been done before. And that's what we're doing on Space Station, trying to understand how can we go from all these links to the Earth, you know, with communi our communication, which is near real time. Our round trip is now less than two days. Uh, we have crew exchanges, crew supplies and logistics being supplied. We have crew and atmospheric samples coming back to Earth for, for uh, analysis and confirmation. We have modified hardware that goes up to space station. And we have emergency crew re return at any time. And one little problem we have with human space flight is trash. We've got lots of it. And the station, we have, a, have a, uh, a simple and unique way to get rid of it is just burn it up in the atmosphere. Going to Mars, we don't have any of those things. So the research on station that we're doing today is to be able to break these chains here and get to the point where we can go beyond Earth for years without all the, depending on all these uh, links to the Earth. So on space station, um, we can mitigate the ones in green, all these risks uh, in technologies and capabilities and human health and in operations. I won't go through all, all these. You, you, you could read them your, uh, yourselves when this, all this stuff hits the web. But things that, you know, like ECLIS and, and, and radiation monitoring that people can think of. EVA, fire safety, um, uh, high-powered solar cells, variable low-mass thermal systems, habitation systems, and lightweight structures, what we're doing with, with Bigelow. Uh, of course, the human health, which I'll get to in a minute. And the operations I'll also touch on a little bit. Uh, crew autonomy, comm delay, uh, and other operational simulations. So in, in the human research program, station is required to, to, to mitigate 21 of 32 health risks. And the drivers of that for like number of subjects, pharmacology, the muscle uh, uh, degradation, things of that nature. And given the current number of subjects and the risks that we have today, HRP won't be done with their research till the mid 2020s. And the way we keep track of that is with this eye chart, which I don't expect you to read. But the way you, the way you read it, the red is, 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 is unacceptable risk, the yellow is acceptable, and the green is controlled. Now the ones that are here in red here, here are the critical ones that basically to, to keep the crew alive. So 
those will not be mitigated if you look here until about the 2025 time period when they, especially this one here, which is, which is food related and this one here, which is muscle. So we have a lot of work to do in human research uh, to mitigate the risk of going beyond low Earth orbit for long duration space flights. Now we're doing the same thing for technology de development and, and capability development. Uh, for ECLIS, I'm not going to go through all this, but for ECLIS and environmental monitoring, we have goals to reach on space station and, uh, and from a technology standpoint. Same thing in environmental monitoring. For environmental monitoring, for instance, we have to break that chain. We can't bring samples back to Earth when we go beyond uh, low Earth orbit. Like if you stay at the moon for, for, uh, for three months or for a year or go to Mars for three years, we, there's no samples coming back. So all that, has to, all that monitoring has to be done on orbit. So we're developing the technology and the, and the crew procedures along t uh, t to do that. For ECLIS, our plan is to, to run the, the Mars ECLIS system on space station for at least two years. Now, given that all that work, we, we have uh, uh, run that out, all, uh, all the schedule and technology development and, and, and notional budgets. To complete all that work, we won't be done on space station until about the same time HRP, around 2025 time frame or so. Some examples of the recent lessons learned for exploration. Uh, you've probably heard about uh, Luca's uh, uh, water problem in the EVA suit. Um, we've taken those lessons that we've had over the years with the EVA suit and we're building a new EVA suit that will not have those same failure scenarios. So we will not have the problem of getting water into the suit in the new EVA suit just because of different, different technology. On ECLIS, our, our, our uh, CO2 removal beds, we've had uh, some, a lot of uh, manufacturing issues. We've now solved, we think we've now solved those manufacturing issues and we're going to be testing those new absorbent beds on space station. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, we've had recent indications of coliforms aboard the space station. Right now, we have to wait to get those samples down to the ground to understand what's the, uh, what's the significance of those. We can only detect that there's coliforms on, on station. We can't tell what kind they are, how many, or anything like that today. So uh, we're coming up with technology to be able to, to do just that. Um, the crew that's coming down this evening will go through a new field test, uh, basically to test their, op their operational uh, capability right after landing, which would be also be critical for going for long duration space flights on another body. The, the, uh, starting off with just three simple things, a sit and stand test, a simulated recovery from a fall test, and a tandem heel, heel and toe walk test. This will be done within a first couple of hours uh, of, of landing in a medical tent. And this is being done, done jointly by the, uh, by the U.S. and Russian doctors. So that's just one of the ex examples of an operational uh, simulation that we're doing. Getting back to, to the uh, partnership we've talked about before with Kathy, um, really the crown jewel of space station is not the hardware, it's not the research, it's not any of those things, it's the partnership. That's the crown jewel. Uh, over the years of, of going from freedom into International Space Station, it took a total of nine years to negotiate the policy, the political, and the programmatic aspects of the, state, of, of the program. The program is complex enough to engage all the major spacefaring nations. If it was less complex, you probably wouldn't get maybe an ESOR. You may not get Russia, but if it's, it's complex and difficult enough where it takes all of them working together. And that's, I think, critical lessons to learn for going to, to complex missions like going to Mars. That'll be large and complex. Uh, with station going through tw uh, at least 2028, if that's approved, we have a program that's viable and, 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 and uh, that will, can keep the pr partnership together. Without space station, if it ends in 2020, there would probably not be an opportunity to create this partnership ever again. The politics and, and, and just the, the, the state the world is in today, that partnership will probably never be pulled together again. So it's vital to keep this partnership together if we think we're going to use that partnership or if we're going to go to hard destinations like Mars or, or, or long duration missions to asteroids or the like. So how do we know when space station is done? If you look at all our, our, our goals, let's take for instance advanced benefits to humanity through research, has the station life been fully exploited uh, to the benefit of science and research? In other words, 
Are we spending more time fixing the space station, or are we spending more time doing research? The thing that happened with MIR. MIR was so caught up, the MIR program was so caught up in trying to fix, the, fix it, it was got to be too expensive for the Russians to, to maintain anymore, so it was abandoned. So that's the kind of questions we have to ask ourselves. Is station now just too, too cumbersome? Is it, is it too broken to fix or too expensive to fix? Uh, going on to enable human missions beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, ha has all the critical technologies been, been uh, demonstrated that, that we need, like eclipse and, and human health and performance? Has the fly-off plan been completed? Uh, how do we know that, that we've accomplished our mission in, um, in enabling the commercial market? Has an independent, non-government uh, demand been, been established in low Earth orbit? Or is the government still, you know, the sugar daddy of, of the industry? Has, uh, has, a, has a commercial low Earth orbit platform been established other than the government to satisfy government needs? And for international cooperation, has a partnership, you know, a firm partnership been established to go to Mars or to other des destinations? So that's all I have for you today and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Sam. Well, while I ask Kathy one question, everybody else start thinking about additional questions that you would like to address to the panel. Kathy, I, as I read the Global Exploration Roadmap, I found it to be a very interesting and informative overarching strategy for future exploration, almost like level zero type requirements. Has your team thought about what are the sub-indentured requirements or next steps to implementing that nice overarching structure that you put together? Um, in some cases, yes, because um, it's been important to help inform decisions along the way. And in other cases, no, because we recognize that, uh, you know, ultimately it's when agencies decide to partner that the real prioritization and detailed decomposition, let's say, of objectives and requirements would take place. So um, we, we, uh, we, we try to, you know, everything in its time. Don't do, do something today if you can do it tomorrow. Uh, or, or that may be obsolete or maybe overcome by events uh, tomorrow is probably a better way to say it. But um, so to the extent that it's needed to inform a conceptual architecture at the conceptual level, in many cases, yes, to the intent. And it, to the extent that it's required to really decide things at lower levels, um, no. Okay. Some questions from the audience. Jeff? You know, I would say yes, and, and a lot of the things that are reflected in the roadmap are, are, are things that occur at, you know, at, at, at a, uh, even within ISS program discussions, right? The, uh, the roadmap reflects the current state of the pieces coming together. Um, and, and so I think that to, to um, uh, so along those lines, the, the, the consensus is that, um, that Planning the transition from ISS to beyond, it's really important to um, to um, to not ensure to, to not have a gap, right? To not have a gap. So recognizing that, that all the things that Sam talked about uh, uh, as important to do on ISS are, are important to do, and and they and um, and so doing them until uh, is it, it, getting the support to continue to do them on ISS while at the same time you plan for going forward. Yeah. Um, it was the extent that we talked about it within the road mapping work. And Jeff, you know, within NASA, we've had l lots of discussions recently about extension of station beyond 2020. Uh, we are currently in discussions with the administration about just that very thing. So no decisions have been made, uh, but we're in discussions right now. To what degree are those discussions dependent on international acceptance or interest? I think. Um, being to lead 
we, our intent is to lead. Um, if we don't lead, somebody else will try to lead, at least. Um, I think our leadership in the global uh, w world depends on our commitment to space, sta to space station uh, in human spaceflight. Uh, and uh, we're going to make that decision. We want to make that decision independent of where the partners are. Now, all the partners are at different places. I can tell you that on, on where they are about extending the space station. You can't be that shy. Come on. In the back. Oh, it's already on. Sorry. Um, let me make sh uh, maintainable. Do you mean what is the durations that we're talking about? Yeah. So for so I think the way you'd look at that is for uh, Orion for like the asteroid mission. It's really going to be driven by uh, the crew size and the consumables. Really, not the not the duration. Um, so right now we're looking at four people, 20, 20 to 30 days you could probably make work. Now the Orion system is designed to operate in a quiescent mode up to about six months. So you know you put them kind of in a dormant mode where there's no crew on board. So if you were going to uh, Mars, you basically do the attachment, the crew gets out of the Orion and then they're, they're in the HAB module to do all their exercise and everything else in there. And you're basically shutting the systems down to the minimum. But certainly for a Mars trip, you need to bring some spares. I expect over that year, three years, depending on what you do, and there'd be some things replaced. It's much, much like we designed it when it was originally going to go to space station, right, where it sits on board and is basically hanging out there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a plan in place to uh, physically deorbit it. Um, uh, we ha we have we're working on a plan and working on the details of that plan to to deorbit the entire space station. Yes, so um, it takes uh, it's quite a bit of effort. It takes uh, several months to lower its orbit and then to um, precisely uh, bring it in over the uh, Pacific Ocean. So. Um, it, space station will have an end. It will have a definitive end. Uh, and you will probably be able to see it on your l local news channel. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, now, reuse of modules, that's possible. I in 2028, some of the modules will probably still have quite a bit of life left in them. Um, that dis you know, those kind of discussions uh, have been going on and off for some time. Uh, we're too early for that. We're still, we're mainly um, focusing on the utilization of space station right now and getting its full use out right now. Uh, we'll get to the point where we can st actually start talking. So for, we gotta see, we gotta actually get the, the operational life understood. We have data today that tells us we can go to 2028. We'll actually see when we actually operate it, get, s get more measurements on board the space station. We'll see what the structural life will actually be when we actually get there. Let's see. Next to you and then you, Jeff. Yeah, so rem that, so that I actually I believe is part of the legislation. Uh, <laughs> Jeff's helping me remember. So it's part of the legislation that that's a capability that, that we're supposed to have. Um, at the moment, we're not actually doing any design or development um, uh, in that vein. But the, the system in general was designed to support flying people up and down uh, to handle quiescent mode, to handle MMOD environment. So there's really... Uh, there's no fundamental changes to make that happen. Like you said, it's overqualified, and that's why that's not its mission today. 
Um, there are other things that we would want to accelerate if that turned out to be the case, which is this rendezvous and docking capability, the integration with the docking system, right, which we're not doing, Nate, because right now we don't have a, a docking mission and exploration capability. So. Yeah, there's nothing in the design that says you couldn't do it if you wanted to do it. Yeah, we'd have to we'd have to accelerate those other developments like the docking system and rendezvous and docking to make that happen. Yeah, Jeff. Uh, just a question on back on station extension. Uh, again, referring to that law, uh, that's the only thing that was Well, I would great to have that problem. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Peter, can you hear the, <laughs> could you hear the question, Peter? Okay. Just want to make sure people could hear it in the back. Yeah. So, so Jeff, you know, I, I, would, I would be happy to have that problem next year or the year after. I would happy to have that problem. That means we need another station, maybe a commercial space station. Uh, so that's the position we actually want to be in. Um, and we're working hard uh, with cases to make that happen. <laughs> no, yours is going to be a good question. I'm looking forward to it, since they have to answer. We've talked about a lot, a lot about roadmaps and plans, and the roadmap is really uh, a lot of flight plans. What are you going to be doing during the next time from, how are you going to get from here to wherever it is you want to go? The flight plan is not complete unless you understand your, your fuel consumption. And, and uh, one of the key elements that I think we need to understand is what's your fuel consumption rate here, not actual fuel, but dollars. And then another metric, I think, is mass and volume. And um, when you really have talked about three different parts, I'm oversimplifying, but there's really three parts here. One is the, the lift capability to get things off the surface of the Earth to, to accomplish the missions. The other is two different versions of long, either long duration or long distance flight. You can look at them both the same. The space stations, people staying on board for long duration, the station itself is traveling at tremendous distance. Kathy, do you want to try a cut at that? I, I could try. Um, you know, in the in the discussions with our partners on this roadmap, right? We've um, we've talked about um, important metrics like uh, is since it's a human spaceflight roadmap. You know, if you're flying less than one human mission a year, is that a sustainable human spaceflight program? You know, you can have that argument, maybe yes, maybe no. So we'd like to be able to get to the point where there's, a, there's one mission a year, uh, at least. And so if you bring in the Russian transportation system with our transportation system, maybe you could imagine there's requirements to get you, you further, get, get more missions and money to get you more missions. So, uh, but, but minimum one mission. Um, and so um, the, the assessment of whether we could conceive that to be affordable because some years you know it's just really one SLS one SLS Orion launch and when you start talking lunar missions it's more than one launch a year so to, to make it an affordable scenario we we, uh, we don't share the specific information about what we think we, what it would cost. We, we as agencies, kind of envision the role that we want to play and imagine whether it is, um, is, is affordable on our, on our part. The, uh, you know, the going to your mass, your mass metric, I mean, I think everybody recognizes 
that um, that mass is is king in a way that the human spaceflight community doesn't understand right now, and that's why a lot of the the emphasis has been on trying to um, define these lunar vicinity missions in a way to um, to inform and learn about how do we how do we really you know learn to live with a reduced supply chain or without a supply chain? How do we how do we learn to get you know the uh, the, the fact that Curiosity can can live with a with a hundred watt um, power supply? You know, it's it's completely it's it's a whole different way of thinking for the human spaceflight community. So using these near-term missions to try to drive out some of those solutions that will make the long-term program sustainable. So those are the the extent to the of the discussions we have in in the this roadmap. I think. Well, Todd, I know you're laser focused on getting the initial two flights in 2017 and 2021, but I also know that you have a group one of them sitting here, that is looking at alternate paths that can provide a capability to meet some of the missions that Kathy has in her, in her architecture or her roadmap. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Or? Uh, you have, maybe you got to speak more clearly. I, I was taking a different tack to answer Frank's question. Oh, okay. I thought you go, were going to hit me up on, a, on affordability and, and what we're doing there, because that's where I'm spending a lot of my time uh, laser focusing these days um, is trying to get fixed costs down and uh, so let me answer what I thought was his question more directly and then you can help me with the other okay. where you might be going um, so I, I was thinking about this I, yesterday I had a chance to go up to see uh, the newly uh, formed Aerojet rocket dine and the first half of the tour we um, we went over to Canoga Park and uh, and my boss was with me, uh, Dan, who spent some of his early career out there. And at the end of that first half of the tour, it, we were all kind of down in the mouth because we're walking around, the place is almost empty. They're, they're almost out. Um, and Dan talked about it early in his career when you would walk around in there and there would be lines backed up at the, at the cafeteria and RS-25s down the hall and, uh, you know, the place was a buzz. And, and so we were kind of down, and, and so we went over to DeSoto and, and had lunch, and then we toured that factory. And I'd seen it before, but um, when you see what they've done over there and what they've done with a much smaller footprint, the footprint now is less than, well less than 50% what it was, but what they've done is made a, a manufacturing facility that can make um, J2Xs, RS-68s, and I did ask them if you could make RS-25s there, and they say yes in this footprint. And what you see is it, out of that necessity of trying to get the cost down, they have now innovated and found new ways of manufacturing. And it's state of the art. It won't take as many people. So we, we can wax poetically about the good old days when 400,000 people were working on the Apollo program, or uh, we can look at what it's going to take to actually do this as affordably as we can. Um, to take another example, um, ATK, um, a lot of what they've been doing with value stream mapping is getting down the cycle time and the number of touch labor hours and miles it has to go in the factory to get out, uh, to get a booster out. They reduced it 46%. But to be honest, what we heard in the previous uh, panel is you can push too far if cost is nothing but king, right? And so what's coming out of some of this stuff we're looking at on this debond thing is it might have been some of the value stream mapping we did might have affected um, our process and we might have gone too far in an area so we're off we're off submarine and trying to find the bottom of what is the fixed cost uh, and how small can we make it and we're doing that across the board we're not just doing uh, the primes either uh, Mishu um, we used to pay over 120 million dollars a year to keep Mishu running um, that number now is less than 50 million we're getting it down into the 30 range including the 25 million or so it takes for, for the fair share of, of the core itself. So we're continuing to try to drive that down um, as we move forward. And, th and that's just, that can't, to me, that's the carrying cost of as you go forward, no matter what the flight rate is. I'd love to get the flight rate up. But what I've got to focus on to be successful is continuing to get those things down. We mentioned selective laser melting. That's another one where we believe if you're going to make rocket engines, you're going to make uh, make them uh, less expensively selective laser melting has a, is a big leverage point and so we're really interested in that and, and we I don't know if you were here when we talked about it earlier we've actually got parts we're testing the J2X with on the stand today um, so we're, we're doing everything we can um, to get those costs down we've we've reduced the government workforce we've reduced um, not only the total number 
of government uh, folks, but we've reduced the number of support, the percentage of support contractors relative to the government uh, from 60-40 down to 60-40-60 you know, the other way. So um, across the board, we're trying to reduce that fixed cost. Uh, frankly, I was surprised to hear how many people are working at one of the, the commercial vendors out there today compared to the total numbers I see in, in my budget. Um, and so um, it makes me feel actually pretty good about where we are these days. And I'll, so what was your other question? I'll, I'll, you, were, you were addressing the, the cost metric. You know, Frank was talking about performance cost and schedule, kind of like in the earlier one. Right. I was trying to talk about the performance metric and that you are off looking at evolutionary paths that will enhance the performance metric to help capture some of the additional exploration Sure. So, yeah. So architectures one of, that Kathy yeah, was showing. So, so one of the things that came out of the uh, the trade studies we did during the PDR is what we call an outer loop study, and yeah. we've been looking at uh, ways to. Uh, one of the things we found out during the rack studies was that um, we had to minimize the, the number of simultaneous developments of the rocket, and so we could afford about one development at a time, which in this case is the core. Um, but to minimize the future evolution to get to what we uh, 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 want and to get more bang for the buck um, to get to the evolved capabilities, the, uh, we, it turns out that a dual-use upper stage is a very interesting solution that gives you uh, a lot of bang for the buck with only one additional development rather than three additional developments. I, I don't know if that's where you yeah, were going with that. That's, that was where I was going with that. I don't know if that helps, Frank, uh, what you were asking. It probably <laughs> touched on it. I'm not sure it totally answered. or. Okay. Hmm. So, let me give you a viewpoint from industry. When you all put out an RFP and we propose on it, we give you a price, particularly in this fixed price world, of what it's going to take for us to get the job done that you're asking us to do. NASA is not telling Congress or the American public what it's going to really cost per some unit, like a kilogram, or a person, or an auto mile, or whatever, what it's going to cost to actually get the job done. You're just saying, we'll do the best we can and we'll make it as inexpensive as possible and we'll take you as far as we can. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, if you had a metric that you said was your, if you can all share it with us, yeah, yeah. you had a metric that was your, your line in the sand of, I have got to launch every kilogram for no more than this many dollars for this particular mission, then I think you could be on the right track. But when I, when I bid on a, <coughs> cargo. Even if you work the, car, the contract in a different way, I have at some point got to tell you how much it's going to cost for every kilogram of yours that I'm going to launch the space station. And I can't exceed that. So would you, you want the American public and the Congress to buy what you're selling? You've got to have some hard metrics that, I mean, the things you're talking about are interesting. And yes, I know engineers love talking about that stuff. But if you want to sell it, it's got to have a top line. So, so do you? So that's interesting to me in a construct of a market uh, where there's some type of ROI expected uh, from a business case perspective. And as we said, we've developed low Earth orbit, and now it's time to bring commerce into low Earth orbit. So I would expect in a commercial market where we're going to commercial vendors, I would say, how much is that going to cost me per pound? I would think in exploration where you're doing things you've never done before, that's not quite as uh, a direct um, measurement. No, and I'm not looking for a return on investment because we know what the return is. The return is people going places. It, it's, it's getting people into space and having them go places. But you need to know how much it's going to cost. I agree with that, no, no doubt. You're not going to buy a car unless you know how much it's going to cost. You have to make a term between a Ford Fusion and a, and a Cadillac Escalade. And, and are you recommending we do something like that when we're doing the architecture trades? It's, it almost sounds like you're using, the, you want to use the metric to actually determine Lots what's the best path. That, that you can relate to the non-NASA engineers, the non-industry folks that have to, to, to buy off on this. Okay. Because one of our problems, and we hear this over and over in conferences like this, is we're just really good at talking to each other. We're not pretty good at talking to the outside world and selling them on what mm -hmm. we're doing. They think it's cool, they love it, they're glad we're doing it. They don't understand why we're spending so much money on it. Hmm. Yeah, I think the hard part is putting a value on it. And I, I'm not sure I, I, I think Todd said it right. It's hard to uh, estimate 
with uh, any great fidelity exactly what these costs are, especially when we decide we're going to smash the budget or we're going to tell you, change the budget every year. So when somebody says, tell me, give me, give me certainty for nine years out, which is actually what they asked me to do, give me a certainty in nine years within a confidence level what Orion is going to cost, that is a very hard thing to do. Now, I have a model. I can put it in. I can give you a number. So I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure I agree with you that says we don't tell them because we do based on the model we have I say this is what it's going to cost and I use my contractor value that Lockheed gives me so I didn't just didn't just dream it up um, we do assume uh, some aggressive assumptions Frank as you know because we because I think we should and we tie those aggressive assumptions to specific actions that we're trying to take some come true some don't so we do model that and we do try to do that um, but I think that I think that's going to be the difficulty is then said the part that's hard is the value and that's the kind of things that you know the way Todd described what it means to go exploring it's hard to put a dollar value on that I think we need to do more and more for the same amount of money that we've been given and that's really where this the kind of things that Todd talked about are important one, one so. of the thing one of the ways I think about it is that under a flat budget with two and a half percent inflation every year my challenge every year is to reduce the basic fixed cost two and a half percent a year. I mean, that's the way I think of it. Now, if you've ever managed a program or project, you know that it wants to be a curve, and there's, we're at that place where it wants to be a bump. Um, but once you get off into, into running, you've still got to reduce your fixed cost. And so that's, what, um, that's the way I think about it in terms of being viable for the long-term future, that you continue to find about two and a half percent a year in terms of efficiencies. Closer. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, well, Frank, you know, the last time we had a exploration roadmap and we brought the, the cost to Congress, it got canceled. And Mike Griffin can tell you all about that. No, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The decimal place was in the wrong, wrong column. But I, I also, you, you can look at, like it, at it, this, Frank, this way, too, is there's, there's, you know, what we call total cost. But then there's just the cost to have a program or, 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 or an objective, a cost to have an objective. Every year we pay this price. Every year, you want cable? Guess what? Cable bill over 30 years, go you know, put that together. Would you think about getting cable if you decide it says, it's going to cost me a million dollars to get cable for, for my, my life? Well, you don't pay it all at one time. You pay a little bit at a time. So. That's another, another thing that we needed to have a discussion is what can we afford every year in our budget to, to reach those goals? Okay, I don't want to dominate, but just make sure you listen to what the question was. The question mm -hmm. was not how much are you going to spend for a telegram or how much are you yeah. going to spend for a person to go to Mars or whatever. It was do you have a number? That's what the Congress wants to know. Do you have a number? You can decide how you communicate that to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll take one more stab at my piece of it. Um, you know, there's a lot of places we could go. Um, Patrick Sherman likes to say, Todd, your destination is Kennedy Space Center. And uh, having worked a bunch of those planetary missions where you have a development and you launch the thing and it flies, we're trying to set up our cost around getting to that point because that's something we can measure. We actually can say, how much does it cost to get to that first launch? And so. Um, as part of this key decision point process, we will go through that that whole that whole thing. It's not something we talk about outside the agency until we get through KDPC. But I can guarantee you, we we know that number, and and we know what that is. And it it won't surprise anybody from what we said last time at the at the KDPB. Yeah. 
first place would be London and then your tenth one. So right, you're right. You're talking a longer term strategic thing, and that, like you said, like um, uh, Jeff said, it's above our pay grade for that. Do you have a question? Uh, I just had one. Uh, four years from first SLS to last 17 uh, to 21. My question is the infrastructure you're putting in as a shoe, can you build more than that in the next four years? Uh, what is the capability? Yes. So we have the surge capability to put three cores a year out. Um, yeah. It's, so if you're going to do a, a Mars campaign or something like that, you've got to be able to get Stack them up. A, get a bunch of things stacked up. So Michoud is certainly capable of that. I will tell you though, we've reduced our footprint at Michoud quite a bit, and um, and are also looking at um, just like he's looking at selling space on space station. I'm looking at selling space at Michoud to offset fixed costs there. That, that's one of the ways we reduce our total cost. Now, we're government, so we can always do eminent no do domain if we need the space back, but Mishu can handle it, definitely. As a matter of fact, we are, we are designing the way we build the cores in a way so that about one a year is actually optimum. So the, the group travels around with the pieces of the core rather than having a bunch of people standing at all the stations, right? So you do a launch campaign type? Approach? We definitely could, yeah. Very good. Appreciate everybody hanging in there until the end of the session. How about if we give our panelists another round of applause?